Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Lane, and I'll be your MC tonight. Uh, we're going to have a really interesting conversation. It's uh, kind of a rare treat to have uh, intellectual ventures out here and, and being able to ask, uh, ask the questions. So it should be a pretty fun evening. Um, first, I want to say uh, always thanks to, to Bill and Marianne for having this great location. We're really grateful to have uh, they've got terrific snacks, so if you haven't got some snacks, definitely get some. Uh, they're yummy. Uh, uh, we had uh, a crate of pizzas last month, and that was fantastic, so uh, I really recommend that. Um, so uh, the way the evening goes is we have about a 20-minute presentation, and then we switch over to Q&A. What we really want to focus on is uh, a basic foundation so everybody's on the same page. Russell will provide that. And then after that, it's, uh, it's kind of a free-for-all. It, uh, it should be pretty interesting. Um, this is, uh, it's important that this be a conversation. You know, let, Russell's not really here to lecture anybody. So this should be, you know, ask, you guys should be asking questions and, and he should, uh, I'm sure he'll give us some thought, thought-provoking concepts. Uh, we are filming, so that's important. This will be on uh, the Steam Fence YouTube page and also accessible through uh, their Facebook page about Steam Fence. Uh, and if you're anybody's using social media, of course, her uh, hashtag, our uh, uh, Twitter handle is, is uh, Steam Fence, so please pass it around to your friends. Uh, so, Without any uh, further ado, we're going to introduce uh, Russell Hannigan. He is the, uh, make sure I get this right, senior direct, senior right there. <laughs> director of business development. I had that. I did. I'm, I'm impressed. No, I had no. that. Okay. Uh, so uh, here you go. Um, please take it away. All right. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you, Gwen, wherever you went. There she is. And uh, thank you, Mr. Pace, for uh, allowing us to use this facility. So, um, if you get hungry, there's, yeah. <laughs> um, so I wasn't quite sure exactly what uh, I was going to talk about tonight. Um, wasn't exactly sure what the event was, but I really like the idea of talking about science and technology and all those other things that go on in this kind of, you know, open forum. Uh, so I, I do have a few slides. Uh, some of you may be curious about what we do at Ivy. Um, uh, but again, we're going to keep it as interactive as, as everybody wants it to be, and we'll, and we'll see where that goes. So um, a little bit about intellectual ventures. Um, I was thinking about this on the way here. I've been there five years, and I'm still not exactly sure what it is, how to define the company. People say, well, what does your company do? And I say, well, we invent stuff. And at the essence, that's what we do. I mean, invention is really the core of everything, uh, whether it's your cell phone, your laptop, the threads in your shirt, the tiles in the ground. Someone had to come up with this stuff, and they had to invent it. And it's more than just people just inventing it. Obviously, they need to be able to create uh, intellectual property around that. They need to be obviously rewarded for that, monetize it in some way. So Ivy is all about trying to figure out a really efficient way not only to create new stuff, but also to help inventors um, realize um, the, the value of their invention because we need to invent things, right? If we're going to create uh, new jobs, high paying jobs, if we're going to create new things, new value, solve problems, it's all about bright people inventing stuff. And the more efficiently they can invent things, the more economically efficiently they can do that and protect that, then the better chances we'll see those inventions. So um, thinking about what we do, we use the word cool a lot. So I apologize if I use the word cool a bit too many times tonight. But really, one of the nice things about an invention company that isn't in a particular industry is that we cover all industries, all sectors. Anything that where we see there's an opportunity to create something new, um, we will pursue it. We will look at it. And my role. Um, I didn't really uh, give you much of a bio, but I've been uh, in the kind of the business development field for the last 20 years, whether it's in the SATCOM industry or the laser scanning industry. I've also been a consultant to uh, various industries and in helping them build business models. My role 
in IV is to help identify interesting technologies and figure out how to turn that into um, primarily to new companies, which has really been 90% of my focus. So a little bit more about IV. We're actually structured into three major funds. Um, starting on the right-hand side is the Invention Development Fund. So these two I don't work in. I focus in this area, just so you know. So I'll just touch on those really quickly. This is a really interesting fund because there are inventors all over the world, particularly in Asia, but also in Europe and in, in the US. Inventing is, is an expensive thing to do. Getting a patent is an expensive thing to do. And it's a treacherous path because there are so many other things and inventions in that area that, um, that you have to be aware of. And so what we do is we issue what we call requests for inventions in topic areas that we think of interesting. This goes out to our network of 4,000 active inventors and 400 universities who say, hey, we've got this good idea and they'll send us the idea and we cull through that and we winnow that down into the ones which we think are most interesting. And then we go off and patent it and they get a big share of it and so on. And it's just, it's just a really neat way of trying to really tease out some fantastic ideas through this huge network we have around the world. The investment investment fund is all about buying usually dormant patents or patents that really people haven't done a lot with and trying to aggregate those with other patents to create portfolios that people can use uh, for whatever purpose. Um, one of the things we did last year, or I think it was last year, we led the um, uh, the purchase of Kodak. And everybody remembers Kodak, right? Kodak, used, everybody used to have Kodak stuff. Well, they kind of didn't follow in the way the world was going and they went into bankruptcy and to get out of bankruptcy they needed to raise some money. And one of the things they needed to do is obviously they needed to sell something. And so they wanted to sell their intellectual property in digital imaging. Turns out that a lot of people use their patents without realizing they're using it and other things like that. So we were the leader. We led that with a consortium. And as a result, Kodak was able to emerge out of bankruptcy and become a you know, going concern again. So that's kind of the other end. And the area where I focus on is all about invention from scratch. The Invention Science Fund is all about homegrown inventions and um, really trying to create game-changing technologies, game-changing products that actually mean something to someone. And, and my role in business development is it's not about creating the minutia of the technology, it's about seeing how does this technology fit with someone who needs something? How does it solve their problem? And that's what we try and do all the time. Um, within the science, Invention Science Fund, and really generally, but primarily here, we have a lab. And I'll show you a picture of the lab in a minute. It's a lot of really smart people, uh, a lot of PhDs, and we do a lot of really cool stuff. There's that word again. And then part of that is the global good, uh, which is, again, I'll talk about in a minute. It's all about, it's not about profit making, it's about solving really hard challenges in the developing world. So that's just a quick overview. Um, one of the things about IV is we have a lot of really smart people. And so if you're uh, put off by that in the company, and I can sit in meetings for an hour and not have an idea what any of these guys have said. Uh, there are a lot of really brilliant, brilliant folks. You just gotta kinda suck it up and focus on, on your part of the business, which is helping the stuff that these guys create and other people create, trying to marry that together with what the marketplace wants. Um, again, covering all aspects. These two guys I know really well because they're the, the fathers of uh, the metamaterials technology, which I'll talk about in a little while. But again, there's 120, there's an extended network larger than that. And these guys and invited folks and our own staff, we sit in this big conference room with microphones and tape recorders and we start off with an idea, we get on the whiteboard and we create stuff. And you can start at point A and get to point Z and you have no idea how you got there because it's a free flowing kind of activity. So that's what we do, uh, one of the things we do anyway. Uh, the lab, we machine things, we make electronics, we synthesize chemicals, we even grow mosquitoes. We have a, a facility for doing that. We figured out how to grow mosquitoes, and it turns out it's a really difficult thing to do. Something called artificial diet, with special bladders because they only drink blood and all that good stuff. So we figured out how to do that, and we needed to grow mosquitoes because we want to kill mosquitoes. So you can't kill them until you, you grow them, and I'll talk about that in a second. 
under global good. So global good, and, and, and so I'm not directly involved in a database with global good, but it's just so cool what we're doing in this space here that I think it's really worth spending just a couple of minutes on. Um, global Goods is funded by Bill Gates. Bill Gates is a part of Ivy, and essentially what he's trying to do is trying to solve some really tough problems in the developing world through technology, and maybe none of these will actually work. We don't know. Maybe some will, some won't. But the idea, it's in the lab, uh, and with his clear knowledge of what's happening in the world, in the developing world, is to experiment, to play, to try different things. And we're starting to see some real traction. Um, we at IV manage this under the Global Good Fund. And again, it's not driven by, in this case, profit, but obviously it's got to be of, of use, of value. And one particular area, which you may or may, uh, may have seen something about, is the whole area about how do you get vaccines to folks uh, where the infrastructure is you know, less developed. And uh, if you just look at what you could do in terms of lives that you could save simply by getting vaccines to the right place at the right time, it's mind blowing. And these statistics are, are, are it, it, tragic and terrible. And so, you know, Bill said to us, um, it's really hard to get vaccines to Ethiopia or wherever, or, or out of the village because there's no electricity. And when there, there's a refrigerator and, the, and you know, someone's got to maintain that, everything's suboptimal. So he said, how do you keep vaccines just above uh, freezing for a long period of time without any electricity? And so we started, um, something called cold chain. So this is about yay big, and it's a big thermos flask, basically. We started there, and that was number one, and we thought, well, that didn't work so good, so we did a whole bunch more. And the idea here is, as we progressed through, we were able to make the, the uh, samples of vaccines in the center of this stay cold for longer and longer and longer, to the point where we got to about here, and we could put this thing out in the sunlight at 35 degrees centigrade, 80 whatever, 87 degrees Fahrenheit, and it will stay just above zero centigrade uh, in real money um, for three months, all right, without any electricity, three months. Because we worked really, really hard with, uh, not just with building, but with computer simulations and design to minimize the heat flow, because heat flows from hot to cold, heat flow from the outside through the materials into the center. So, um, so then we took that to various places in Africa, and those, that's when you start learning about the practical realities of building something there and maintaining it. And one of the ways they carry it around is on the back of a motorcycle. And the problem with motorcycles is they tend to fall over. And if you've ever had a thermos flask and dropped it, they tend to go smash, um, if you have a really, really good one anyway. So we, we did this a lot, actually. Uh, we went there a lot. Um, and so we built this. And so it's got nice big bumpers on it. Uh, inside, these are uh, ice packs. So you've got to freeze those. You freeze those, you put them inside through the hole in the top, and there are the vaccines. And again, that will stay the center of it even when you go in and out many times, that'll stay just above, or a couple of degrees above freezing for three months, there about three months, even on the hottest days. We put these in our ovens and other things. So really, really impressive. Um, and they're in the field and people are trying them and doing it. And so we're, we're hoping that this is one of those things that can be done, one of these really simple things that can be done to hopefully make a difference. Um, we've been working on it for the last five years. Yeah. Uh, we have another part of Global Good, which is the Institute for Disease Modeling. We've got about, I think, about 30 people on this, I think it is. We have this huge computer cluster, and all they do is they try and model uh, how diseases and things propagate. So they really model very closely how a population works and what they do and their nearest neighbor and all that kind of stuff. And so you could really track the way in which um, disease is transmitted, and then you can test ways on how to interrupt that, uh, that flow. So again, some, some just amazing software and some of the most powerful computers 
really in the U.S. Um, that that operate this thing. Um, oh, oh, there's a simulation, but I won't I won't worry about that right now. And then getting on to, you know, in in my world, there's no good, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a good mosquito. They should all be killed. They're all bad. And so. Uh, being a little flippant, but being more serious, obviously, malaria is a is a clearly a big deal. I forget what the statistics are, but it's millions of people die every year from malaria. And this has obviously been a big area for Bill and the Bill and the Linda Gates Foundation. And so the idea was, so, so let me go back a step. Some of the people on our team, the inventors, come from the old Star Wars project from a long time ago, and they're all about lasers and shooting stuff out of the sky. So we said, well, could we kind of shoot mosquitoes? And turns out that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, so we figured it out. Now, unfortunately, you can't see it very well in here, but there's a mosquito, and it gets hit by a laser, and it dies. And it's really a wonderful video because the mosquito dies. Um, but it, it, you know, it's a difficult thing to do because what you need to do is, you know, here's the laser curtain coming through, and you don't want to kill bees, and you don't want to kill things that are good. You just want to kill a damn mosquito. In fact, you want to kill the female mosquitoes because those are the ones that, that bite. The males are fine. Um, and so what we do is we can actually measure the wing beat frequency, and you can differentiate between a male and a female mosquito. Right? And it's very distinctive, and it's very repetitive. Um, so it's a fly or a bee or a grasshopper or whatever. Those are fine. They go through. The moment we pick up the frequency, the wing beat frequency of a mosquito, we hit it with a laser, and it's this is a, an X mosquito. Um, the, the 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 thing about it is we wanted to do something that you could actually build, and it didn't cost too much. And these are a lot of parts that we got on eBay and other places. So we use commercial off-the-shelf parts because you don't want to go to, um, you know, a different country and. Uh, Africa or wherever you're going to go, or Asia, and you know, have something that costs a million dollars because then you know you could hire a bunch of people to swat the mosquitoes. It'd be probably more effective. So it had to be done really in effect, really efficiently. And this is a very, very inexpensive device, uh, but very powerful. So that's a, um, a little bit about global good. Now going to the entire different. So we, that's that's one area. This is an entirely different part of our business. And this is about um, spin-outs and creating new game-changing technology. And the reason why we do spin-outs, or one of the, one of the nice things about spin-outs is if you do create something that's game-changing, then it'd be kind of nice to you know, uh, benefit from that, to, to put it nicely. And so what we do is we come up with these ideas and we will incubate them in our lab. So we'll actually build something to prove that our idea works. And a lot of the stuff we're doing in this context of metamaterials is very new. It's just totally new technology. Um, so the idea is to reduce the, the, the technology risk. Uh, and so we go out to the marketplace and work with customers and say, hey, we've got something here which we think can solve a problem you have. How about we work together? And that's typically how we'll go. So we'll always be working with a customer hand in hand to make sure that what we do from a technology point of view is relevant to someone. That's kind of my, my primary role is making sure that we don't just develop stuff for the sake of it because that's not a lot of good if you're trying to pay your investor back, investors back and keep the company going. We have already done three major spin outs. Our fourth is really close to launch and we have a bunch of other spin outs that we've created as well. They're, they're a little smaller um, and don't get as much airtime, I guess, as the other ones. So what are metamaterials? Um, it's a great name. Uh, it's actually a, uh, the science and the mathematics I wouldn't even attempt to, to do because I, I just accept that it works. But one of the really nice things about metamaterials is that it allows you to control the propagation of some electromagnetic radiation through a material. And you're creating that material so that the beam goes the way, where you want it to go. So if you think about a prism, and light goes through a prism and it gets bent downwards, right? If you, or a lens will focus. By artificially changing the material, the structure of the material, you can make it go the other way, right? Which sounds really counterintuitive, but it turns out you can do that. 
Now, to do it at visible wavelengths is really, really hard. Um, but it, but at, at microwave RF uh, wavelengths, it's a lot easier. And so these are a bunch of examples of essentially circuit boards that we create in order to manipulate um, RF radiation. I'll explain a little bit about what that is in, in a minute. But one of the really interesting things about it is we can make it dynamic, right? So that beam goes through the material, comes out in a certain way, and we can make it so that you can twist it and adjust it and move it in whatever direction you want it to do in a very, very simple, um, from a materials point of view, a simple way, although the mathematic, mathematically it's very complicated. So you may have seen there's been stuff in the media about cloaking. And yes, the, the folks that we work with are the people who invented the idea of, of the cloak. It's, it's not science fiction. Uh, it's actually kind of sort of possible. Um, it isn't possible at all frequencies, but at some frequencies it is. And the idea of the cloak is that if you have a material around something, it channels the light through it and out the other side, or, or the other way around if you're looking at it, of course. So effectively, it renders whatever's in between uh, as invisible. Okay. So we own the intellectual property to how to make one day in the dim future, Harry Potter disappear. And my daughter found this gift, so it's kind of cool. We don't know if actually in the end it's really, you know, thousand years in the future with exotic materials where you could do this. But the principle is the same. The idea is that some material, some structure is rooting the, the light behind around it so it appears there's nothing in there. So if you go to an investor and you say, hey, we're going to build a cloak and 100 years from now we're going to make money, they will kind of show the door and um, they don't call you back. Um, so we thought, well, maybe there's a, something better that we can do. It's a bit more, a little bit more ter near term. And uh, this is actually kind of where I, when I joined IV, I was uh, partnered with a guy from, so I, I mentioned Professor David Smith. He had a, his protege, I guess is the right word, Dr. Nathan Kuntz. He came over and he knows all about practical metamaterials. materials. And so we worked together and he said, um, well, we can do this, that, and the other, and we looked at the applications. And there was a moment when he, he said, I think I can steer a beam. And I'll explain why that's important in a minute. And for me, the light bulb just went off as far as applications, because the ability to steer RF radiation wherever you want it to go is actually really an important, and it's going to, important for everybody. Uh, anybody who used anything like a cell phone or um, radar or whatever it is. So we started looking at communications, sensing, and imaging as the immediate applications where customers existed today for that. So we invented something called the metamaterial surface antenna technology. And what this is, is, is really just a hologram, right? So the RFN, so this is a circuit board. Just think of it just a flat, simple circuit board. These are very special devices called resonators on here that are designed in a very particular way. And as the RF energy flows through it, we switch these on and off in a particular pattern. And that pattern of on and off defines which direction the beam goes. Okay, so I know that's a lot to take in in, in one go. So trust me, it works. Um, and uh, it's really kind of cool. So again, it's this pattern, which is a holographic pattern. In the same way a, an optical hologram works, we just do it at RF frequencies. And this is really, um, really very interesting. So why is it better than anything else? Um, if you want to steer some RF energy around from point to point, there are two ways to do it today. You can either have a, a dish that spins on its axis. You may see these things at the airport, right? Kind of a radar kind of thing. Um, if you look on uh, some of the uh, airlines, uh, Southwest, and those, you'll see this big bump on the back of the fuselage. Underneath that bump is one of these. It's a dish that spins and tilts. There's a mechanism underneath there. Because it turns out it's really hard to steer a beam. You can do it electronically with something called a, uh, an active or a passive phased array. And, and these work brilliantly. But the problem is they're extremely expensive and also very bulky. So if you want to put one of these on a car, forget it. They're too expensive. 
or a, or a boat or whatever. If you want to put it on an F-16 or an F-18, no problem, you can do that. But if you really want to penetrate the commercial market, then it's kind of difficult. Ours, on the other hand, is just a circuit board. It's very easy to fabricate. It's very inexpensive. It's very thin, lightweight. I almost brought one along, but it's just a circuit board. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, the, the, the brilliance of it is the mathematics behind the unit cells on the surface that creates this hologram. Oh, the other thing I, f I forgot to mention, we control this in exactly the same way this display works on a laptop or on your cell phones through a row column addressing. So each one of the little elements there is controlled by a matrix control system. Right? So it's kind of like a holographic display almost, but at RF frequencies. So why is beam steering important? Um, demand for wireless is just going nuts. And it's going to go even more nuts with the advent of 4K devices. Um, so over time, the need for data, and it's all video, right? 80, 90% of what we do is video. And we're getting to the point where everything is going to be connected. So how do you do that? when you have a limited amount of spectrum available. There's only so much spectrum available. And by spectrum, I mean uh, what, whatever the frequency is when you, you, know, you, you tune things. And you can increase the capacity by doing really smart things like compression or, or tight regulations or bigger apertures. But at some point, you're going to hit that limit. How do I do that? And the way to do that is instead of your cell phone radiating to everybody at the same time, why wouldn't it just radiate where the, where the base station is? So think about it. When you use your cell phone, the energy, the, the radio signal that goes from your cell phone goes everywhere. But there's only one little antenna on the base station over there that's actually going to pick it up. So what if we could focus it and do the same back? If you could do that, then this line goes way up because I can now cut up the spectrum in much finer slices. The bandwidth, the speed goes up, the cost comes down. So this is really very exciting to think about. Actually, very carefully and, and smartly using our precious spectral resources um, very wisely. And the second example I wanted to talk about, and then I'm almost done. Um, and uh, this, is, this is kind of really the genesis behind a lot of the work that we wound up doing was in satellite communications. So the other way you can um, manage spectrum is through a very tight regulatory environment. So if I'm on an airplane or a boat or a car or whatever and I'm trying to communicate with a, um, I'm simplifying things here, with a high capacity satellite, you have to point the beam at that satellite. You cannot point at other satellites because you'll interfere with them. And so the precision which you need to point at that satellite is 0.2 of a degree. So how much is 0.2 of a degree? Well, 0.4 of a degree is across. 0.4 of a degree is smaller than the moon. So when you go outside tonight and see the moon, how small it is in the sky. So this antenna on here has got a point and stayed locked inside the diameter of the moon. And the way that's done today, as I said before, is with a mechanism. Right? And that mechanism is working like crazy to keep the dish pointing in exactly the right direction. And it's got to do it 99.7% of the time. Otherwise, it has to switch off. So we thought, well, stuff the mechanism. You take our device. It's a thin little circuit board, flood it on top. And I can do the same thing much easier. And if I can do that on an aircraft, I can do it on anything that moves. So hopefully, at the end of the day, you'll be able to get really great quality internet access on any mobile platform um, at an affordable price. All right. And that led to our first spin out, which is called Chimeta. Um, to date, so far, that company has raised $62 million of venture capital. Um, uh, we had a customer um, who joined us right at the beginning who, had, who really liked the technology, uh, even though the satellite communication industry is incredibly conservative. Um, and that uh, customer is Inmarsat. You may have heard of Inmarsat. Those are the folks where on the Malaysian airplane that went down. It was Inmarsat's, the satellite pings that helped to think about locating, although they haven't located it yet. So they invested money, not as a shareholder, but as a contract. 
and then we have Bill and a number of different partners there as the investors. The same technology we developed there, or similar to that, we, developed, we created a new company, a second company called Evolve. And the idea of Evolve is to replace those security scanners that you have at the airport. You know the ones where you have to stand like this and it scans you? You can replace that with a sheet or something maybe the size of this table on the wall and you just walk by and it will detect um, bad things if you happen to be carrying bad things. We have another company that will be announced very, very soon, uh, which I won't mention just yet, but um, it follows the same thing, the same core technology. And at IV, what we do is we license each one of these companies to focus exclusively on a particular area and tell them to go off and make it work and just focus on that. So each one of these has a field of use, satcoms, um, imaging, and it's coming. So to summarize, we do a lot of cool stuff. I'm only touched out a little bit of it here, uh, but covering the full gamut, uh, we're kind of spoiled for choice a little bit, so it's important to choose wisely. Um, we, value the, we value invention, we value the role of the inventor. The inventor needs to be rewarded for what they do. Um, we incubate technologies, we actually build stuff. Uh, we test that and we talk to customers and we make sure we're doing the right thing. And as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of work and we just announced a deal with Nestle on a, on a special milking container for milking cows, which is really kind of cool. Um, and there's that word again. So with that, thank you for your attention. Um, okay, so what we're going to do now is really turn it over to uh, kind of like the Q&A session. So, so um, my hope was always that we were going to come up with a, a commercial version eventually that would be good for any uh, anybody who has open access to the world, particularly in the summertime when mosquitoes may be present. But again, part of the work that's being done is, is really to understand all aspects of uh, you know, vector management. Uh, we, we actually did, um, there's, a, there's an issue in uh, orange groves, right? There's the little psyllid, I forget what it's called, it's, it's um, greening. And so this little guy's come up from South America and other places, and it's killing a lot of the orange groves. Started in Florida, now it's progressing across the US. And this is really, really bad, right? Um, because there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, we're able to actually detect psyllids. We, we can see them and we can kill them, right? What people want us to do. So, I mean, they're very much real world applications for this. Yes. Yes. It's actually a pretty desperate situation. It 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 really is. It really is. Now, whether this is the best solution for that, I would I I personally doubt. But it raises awareness, right? Um, we had to understand about the the psyllid and what it what it does and how how it flies. And so we have a really cool video. It's on the wall, and it just throws itself off. <laughs> It's a really bizarre thing, but you've got to understand what it does in order to be able to, because again, we only want to kill the things we want to kill. That's... I think it's worth killing a few. Hmm? I think it's worth killing a few. I guess. <laughs> we study things sometimes too much, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, one area. So I'm going to start uh, the audience questions. Uh, Please. I'm going to come back to the question I have to make. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, it's a great question because we ask ourselves that all the time. Um, we start with is it cool? And do we, can we get excited about it? Do we get, can we get other people excited about it outside? Do we have you know, really solid intellectual property that we can defend? I mean, that's one thing about metamaterials is that it's absolutely foundational, our intellectual property, right? Um, it's kind of like owning the, the patents to how to make silicon wafers. It's that foundational. So that was good. But also, it's just so damn cool. You can do so many amazing things with it. 
in an industry that has seen very little, an antenna industry that has seen very little uh, real development. So it's usually those things that come together. Is there a regulatory pressure to do that? We talked about spectrum. There's some pressures uh, economically, regulatory, technologically. If we can bring those together, then that's the ideal case. There have been ideas where we've, we've got cool ideas and then the person will leave and it will just die or we just can't get momentum behind it. So it's really about you know, yeah, whether you go the extra, that extra little bit to pursue or push. It's a really interesting environment, right? Because you do have this open field. You can play. You, know, you can explore and do things. There's no structure in place that says you must do this or else. And so we have all the opportunity in the world and we've got a lot of uh, investors in and around the company who are waiting for us to propose ideas. This last company, I, I, which I won't mention, we're so oversubscribed in terms of people investing in it, it's just not, you know, it's just extraordinary. You know, if you're, if you're building something in a garage, you might have to do 100 presentations of VCs before someone will buy. We have to turn people away. So, you know, I'm not, I don't really ask you a question, but it's kind of, can we get excited about, do we get people interested in it? Does it have real world applications? And, and off we go. It's very organic, yeah. Well, yeah, it's just, is this, is this cool? I mean, it's that overused word, but you know, if this is cool and people think it's cool, then. Yeah, I think that needs a lot of healthcare capability. Yes, we have a, lot, a huge healthcare portfolio. But the, the healthcare industry works a little bit different from the IT industry and the, you know, the mechanism. Yeah, potentially. So for the inventor or the person with the idea, how are you guys better in the sense of being kinder and gentler without that person feeling like they're about to get an episode of Shark Tank? <laughs> well, we're not, we're not a VC, OK? And the likelihood is a lot of these inventions will take a long, long time to mature. I mean, it is just a, one, it takes three to four years for a patent to actually get issued. And there's a huge prosecution process you've got to go through to actually eventually get something out the other end. So um, it's, a different, it's a different approach. Um, it's not really like the Shark Tank. It's, it, it really isn't. It's much more collegiate, I guess. Okay. Well, you that, know? Was, that, was, that was my it, question. Yeah. If, if the person already has, say, a utility patent or some sort of proof of first start and it's a technology idea and not a marketable commercial product that you buy in stores or online, he's looking for somebody to help bring yes. that idea to market. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's not where we get involved. We, again, in the areas where I work, we're about creating new things to solve new problems and getting people excited about that. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll have 50, well, not 50, but 25, 30 people in the, in the room, in the invention session, and people get on the whiteboard and they'll draw something. How about this? And someone will say, well, that's great. And then we could do this. Or someone, oh, that's stupid. Let's do it this way. And it's just, it just flows. So the inventors have to be internal rather than external? Almost all of them, yes, in, in the area that I work, almost all of them. The amendment is a little different. Uh, we actually made a bet about seven or eight years ago on metamaterials that this was something that's going to, we thought would be used to someone at some point. We didn't know what that use was going to be. We didn't really believe cloaking was going to you know, be there. And it was only, um, I mean, that's why, one of the reasons why I was brought into the company is to say, okay, we got this. Let's think of something useful to do. And you know, it's, been, it's been a great ride ever since. Sure, but you talked about your friend who had the idea for beam steering. Yes. So but he was, he was signed up as an inventor in the company at that point. Gotcha. Okay. Right? And then he joined the company and so on. Okay. Yeah. So we have inventor agreements and you sign a contract and there's a percentage cut that goes down as revenue flows and all this kind of stuff. So we pay back our inventors as needed. So it's all very structured and they know exactly what they're getting into when they do it. And the quality of our inventors, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So we think, we're, we think it's a good model. We think it's fun. They seem to like it. Okay. So let's talk about that inventor group. Uh, how, let, let, let's look at what they are, who they are, where they are. How does one become one? How does one be, get on the inside of, uh, of Ivy? Uh, there's, I know that there's three people with intellectual property in this room, even though it's yeah. a small crowd. Uh, but 
How does one get to the inside? I'm getting lucky, I guess. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's. Um, it, it's a lot of it is personal relationships. It's uh, we will have uh, topic development sessions where we try. What is an what is a what is an interesting topic? There's, sometimes we have sponsored invention sessions or whatever. So it might be in a particular area, and then someone will say, "Well, I know someone who knows something about this." And then we talk to them, and do you want to be part of the invention session? Sometimes they're in companies, sometimes they're independent. It really is all about personal relationships more than anything else. Um, in, again, in the areas where I, where I work. In the, in the area of IDF, the Invention Development Fund, we have a whole website and a whole system where we reach out to universities and individuals that way. It's a different animal. Um, but in terms of what we do, it's, you know, we meet people at conferences. People will contact us. There'll be... And it'll just, stars will align and come together. I, I wish I could say it was a very structured, but that's the nature of invention, right? It's not about structuring and following this and then you get this magic invention. We come up with a lot of garbage as well. I mean, let's, let's be clear. Um, some of the stuff seems like a really great idea at the time, no one's gonna ever use. But, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time in the cold light of day. And then there are things that no one ever thought would be useful and there are some things uh, we were almost thinking of just getting rid of, and then someone raises, raises their hand, hey, I've got an idea. It's just completely um, nebulous. I mean, I, it's- you know, we have a panel or a committee of three or four people that are a target for external ideas coming Oh, we, yeah, we do, we do that. I mean, we, we obviously evaluate things and talk about things, but- um, but I mean, I have no relationship with you or anyone with your company, but I have an idea that ID might be interested in. How do I make you aware of it? Um, I don't know. I give you my business card, I guess. I mean, there's, uh, it's there. There are portals and things for the other parts of the organization. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there. Are, we're probably not the best at that, but at the same time, we're we're also overwhelmed, um, as you as you would imagine. Okay. So, um, is it the most efficient process? No, I don't think it is. We've tried to impose processes and. Um, Turns out it just doesn't jive with the whole, we have a whole triage, internal triage system where we'll evaluate the thousands of potential inventions we get to try and what are the ones at the top we need to patent, what are the ones we, we need to let go. I mean, there is some, but it's, it's uh, So you're making an argument for other people standing up competition? Or maybe an organization like yours so they can take on the ideas you have to learn for them. I think there's plenty of room for everybody. Just so we're looking, you know, we're on the same page, how many patents are we ultimately talking about in the IP portfolio? Um, I think we have 40,000 that are active, and I think there's 70,000 in total. Um, okay. In terms of ISF, the part that I work for, we've created from scratch and have issued well over 1,000 now. And also, to give you perspective, it's roughly six to $15,000 per patent. Yeah, it's 40 to 70,000. Yeah. Okay. And yes. Just to give you kind of scope, uh, Egypt, yeah, Egypt uh, in 2009 had about 30, 35 million people, and they only had about 35,000 patents in all the nation, just to give you perspective. So, yeah. so I find that fascinating. That puts you guys at almost the top of the food chain. We're, in, I think, in the top 10 somewhere, yeah. But it's the breadth of the patents, which I think is really cool. So you open up the catalog, and what do we do now? I just was wondering, do you guys collaborate a lot with nonprofits with your, on your science side? On the, on the global goods side, yes. Um, it depends what it is. Obviously, we have our hands full with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They, 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 I mean, that is 100% essentially what we do is with them. But then it's looking at people who are local. Um, this Matsy uh, milk jug thing. Again, we're doing things locally with, and, and now, now with Nestle on trying to get that out and building thousands of those to, to, to try that. So, so, so yes, but again, it's very, um, it's just, it's the confluence of events which happen is the right opportunity. We don't go out and seek that. Um, don't have a mechanism for doing that. It's, it's, yeah, I'm sorry, it's not a great answer. It's just, it's such a fluid kind of 
way we do things. Um, it sounds like you have a lot of investors investing a lot of money. Yes. How do you go about getting investors? Do you have a team of people that go, I can imagine this big business office up in New York somewhere and you guys present an idea? Or how does it go? How do you get investors? Um, so there's investors in IV itself and then there's invest then investors in the in the spin out companies. We which one are you referring to? In IV itself. In IV? Well that was done principally by the founders, right? And the principal founder and the CEO is Nathan uh, Mirvold, who was the CTO at Microsoft. And he set up he founded IV in two thousand and it really started to get it going in two thousand and three. Um, the idea behind IV was it was going to be about a 20 or 25 person company and doing a few patents every now and again and such was the appetite from brand name companies in the electronic space who really wanted to be a part of this that they were able to create these new funds and right now you know a total of six billion dollars is under management and that's all from other folks who believe in this invention capital marketplace that you know, putting focus on invention and on patent development. If you do that, you'll get a much better result than if you didn't do it. So I don't do that. They do that, obviously. I mean, <laughs> that's what they do. And they've done a pretty good job of it, as you can imagine. But it went way beyond their expectations of what they thought was going to happen. So this was the CEO, the person in charge, got all of your buddies together. Like well, it's more than that. It's more than that. I mean, it's, it's a lot of brand name companies, yeah. Yeah, this is the business model. Are you in? Sure, we're in. You know, that's how it works. It's kind of wild. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that price tag I quoted is actually if you don't have staff lawyers on hand, they have an army of staff lawyers on hand. So, uh, I, I suspect their price tag would probably different. But. It's amazing how expensive it is to. The U.S. is not so expensive, but if you're going to do it in 20 countries around the world, it gets really expensive quickly. Um, you know, translation alone, all the litigate, all the all the, all the prosecution you need to do, and then there's the maintenance fees that kick in every every year. Um, it's easily six figures for most of what we do. So that's way beyond the average inventor. And patents should only be a tiny fraction of the investment in the company. I mean, it should be fractions of a percent because that's just the foundation on which you create value and create things. So, you know, if it's $100,000 to get a patent, you're going to be spending 100,000, 100 or 1,000 times that to actually do something useful. You broke down the different groups. Can you talk about where you see the growth going forward for intellectual ventures? Yeah. It sounds like global good is the kind of a newer area. Global good is, is, is a sort of a standalone effort within, um, within IV uh, because its goal is not profit, it's about solving challenging problems in developing countries. Um, I think my area is, is, is going to grow. We're going to do more spin outs, we're going to create more things. Um, the, the, the market for uh, in the patenting business is kind of a little on hold in the US because of the legislation going on in Washington about defining what patents are, and there's a bunch of stuff around software, as I'm sure you appreciate. So people are waiting for that dust to settle a little bit. Um, I'm not a patent e expert at all. Um, that's the IIF. That's the IIF side, yeah, or the, the global licensing side, which is really an amazing, you know, the idea that you can take disparate patents that have been issued and usually brought into practice and marry them together into a single kind of portfolio is very enticing for a lot of companies you know, to get that protection. So let's look, pull out your crystal ball for a moment and imagine five years, 10 years, 15 years out, you have your finger on the pulse of many, many, many new technologies. Some will fly, some will fail. Uh, what does your gut tell you? How is, how is the technology that you see going to impact the folks in this room? And what, what do you think the future looks like? Wow, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, a really, that's, a, that's a really, really, really big question. Um, gosh, well, I, uh, just speaking specifically about the metamaterial space, uh, and I could, I could talk about robotics, and I could talk about yeah. lumen traveling devices inside the body and all sorts of different things, but the one I know really well is, is 
is um, in the metamaterial space because it's all about keeping up with demand for um, broadband connectivity. Because, I mean, if we think about where we are today, you know, if you get a 20 megabits per second to your home, that's like dial-up was 10 years ago to where it's going to be 10 years from now. You're going to be expecting not 100 megabits per second or, or whatever. You're going to be expecting gigabits per second of capacity. You're going to expect that wherever you go, right? Whether you're at home in the office on an airplane, in the middle of anywhere. It's just, it's like water, fresh water. It's like air. It's like food. And it's impossible to do that unless we are better stewards of the spectrum. And the only way to do that is to not to, you know, a Wi-Fi signal is just broadcast everywhere. It's, if you could actually see it, you know, you would be, you'd like, well, that's such waste, you know? It's like I have a cup of water, like in this enormous bucket, and I pour in the bucket, and it goes over, just to fill up a little cup of water. I mean, it's completely ridiculous, right? So if you can find a way to just put the water in that cup, then you're going to save all this other water. And all that spectrum that's get blasted everywhere, that's, that interferes with it. We can't use that, or we can't use it easily. So um, I'm hoping that, you know, 10 years from now, let's say, that uh, some of this technology will be making it easier for you to do 4K streaming, two-way video, or whatever it is, and all the user-generated content that goes with that. Um, I think that's really very exciting, right? I mean, we think we have a very mature infrastructure today for broadband access. It is, you know, it's you know, it's still nascent in my in my view. So again, I tried to, I know I could. There's lots, and you could, I know, talk about lots of different areas. I just wanted to pick the one which we're really excited about, and that is using using this precious spectral resource wisely. Any uh, any last questions? Let's close in on uh, our our bedtime. Uh, anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was really My pleasure. Thank you very much.